Hey guys, um, thank you for joining me today. Um, today's sermon is called Speak. And you guys know I like to read. Um, I'm an avid reader. Um, and today I'm going to use um, the books I've been reading lately to explain what I mean. The first book I'm going to uh, talk about a bit is a book called The Four Winds by Christian by Kristen Anna. Um, it's been on a bunch of bestsellers lists and it's a really popular book. It's spoiler alert, there's going to be spoilers in this one, so if you're, if you're wanting to read the book, I uh, don't want you to listen. I will put all the books um, on my page so you could get them. Uh, the first book, um, The Four Winds, is about, it's it's in the 30s, set in the Great Depression. It's about this woman. Uh, she doesn't really feel like um, very important or very significant, um, but um, she is a very quiet person, and like she seems to have no not um, been loved by her family. She's a very, she considers herself as very ugly. So one, one night she, she gets d daring and um, she makes her, herself uh, this red dress and then she goes out in this red dress, she meets this guy, and this is their first time meeting, and then when they meet for the first time, they end up in a strange way having sex, if you could call it that, and then they meet again, and then they have sex again. Anyway, she gets pregnant with her and her daughter. And then the, with a daughter, um, the, the woman's name is Elsie, and she, she, um, the daughter's name is Loretta, and then it flashes forward um, to the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. Uh, the Dust Bowl is when Dust um, kept kept um, coming into crops because they lived in Texas, and dust was affecting all their crops, and it was destroying everything—the dust and everything. So, um, to make a long story short. She actually marries the guy, the father of her child, and they live together for a few years. And then one day, he just up and leaves because everything is dying. The animals are dying. Um, crops are dying. Nobody has any money for anything. And he said, and he just says he can't take it. Um, they live with his parents, and he just one day says, I can't take it, so he leaves. And the story is about basically her journey um, in the Great Depression. Um, they eventually, the family, her and her two children, eventually have to leave Texas. Um, and they and they go and they go to California and in California they 
they um, they get jobs as uh, cotton pickers, um, but their jobs as cotton pickers um, it's unfair because um, they're only working for not even minimum wage. And they don't even get paid in money. What happens is the cotton pickers um, belong to this kind of community. And in this community, they have a store where they get all their goods and services. And they, they get a very, very limited amount of money. So I, um, during the book, she meets this, this man who's um, what they call a communist, but, but what I would call basically an activist, because he's trying to fight for all the workers to get more money. And through, through this period, Elsie is very quiet, doesn't say much, kind of just goes along. Uh, but she's strong, but it's, she doesn't really say anything. But her daughter, Lorena, is a spitfire. She just is just outspoken and all of that stuff. So at the end of the book is when Elsie finally finds her voice. Uh, um, um, this guy, Jack, and a few others of, of the, what they call communists, but what I really see is activists, really, um, they, they arrange this uh, peaceful protest or the sitting where, where their plan was to walk into the cotton fields and just sit down. And all this drama keeps, starts going on and Jack gets um, caught and beaten up and all this drama is going on. And, and well, when Jack gets pulled away, Elsie, um, this woman who never said anything, this woman who just took the hand she was dealt and never said anything, she, she, um, she grabs the megaphone and just starts speaking to these people. And but like kind of encouraging them to take a stand and just telling her story about how she came with her kids from Texas to California, expected a better life, and what they got wasn't a better life. And she just rallied these people together um, so much so that the police or the vigilantes shot a gun and, and killed her essentially because she was speaking out against injustice. And as I was reading this book about Elsie and Lareda and Jack and, and which is the son, Anthony, I just began to think of how this woman was so strong, like how when she got pregnant, she married a man she didn't love, she, she sacrificed for her children against all odds, and uh, she went through some really hard times and heroic times, and it made me think of the, the power of 
making me spirit. And it was just so encouraging to see this woman just overcome so much. And even though she lost her life, she died a, a real hero. She inspired a whole bunch of people. And throughout the novel, she just accepts things. But at the end, she finds her voice. And I found that awesome. And I think that when you sp spend so much time being quiet um, and not really saying anything and not really speaking up and have all this anger, anger and frustration inside, it builds up. So Elsie taught me to like speak up, be strong. Deal with what you have to, but don't be afraid to stand up for injustice. Don't be afraid to stand up for what you know is right, even though people may not understand. And although she died in the night, she was a hero. She inspired several people. Um... I remember at the end of the book, her daughter, uh, which was then 18, Lorena, she got a newspaper clipping from Jack uh, about what her mother had done. So even four years after the Dust Bowl, four years after all that happened, her mother would still be remembered because of what she contributed. And in this time of just being an influence, a so-called influencer or whatever, what are we really contributing as a society? What are we really, like, leaving the world with? See, when I look at all these people and all these women, I just tend to think that we're... We're, we're following, we're not leading, and our, our definition of being an influencer is being popular on Instagram, but a real influencer inspires people to change, makes people's lives better, and that's what Elsie in the Four Winds taught me. Um, the next book, I like to talk about is called um, The Trouble with Hating You. This is a very unique uh, rom-com. Every, everybody who knows me knows I love um, rom-coms, romantic comedies. But what's unique about this one is it's actually a Middle Eastern based uh, rom-com. This is about, about a girl, her name is Leah. She um, is a business professional. She is a, a um, Middle Eastern and not really, not really a party girl. But she's very westernized. Like she drinks and she has sex and she does all of this. But um, she, she has a secret. Um, first of all, at least eight, she's not very into her seek. Not not into her not seek Hindu faith. And she's kind of um, not really into that. Although her family is Hindu, they go to temple. Um, they do all the Hindu practices. And she's kind of seen as a pariah because she's very Americanized. Like she drinks coffee and whatever. And she doesn't like going to temple because she's seen as... Um, 
a pariah. So, so um, n- none of the people at Temple really like her because uh, they think she's too American. And there's a rumor going around that she is a loose woman and um, the aunties, which we in the church would call the mothers, uh, turn the older lady, the older ladies like over 60 turn their nose up at her and everyone is just um, turning their nose up at her and she is angry. She's angry, she's very like standoffish and very rude at the beginning. And you understand that, um, you think that's just how she is. And there's this one part in the book where her father arranged a marriage with Jay, um, which is the, the male character in the book. And, um, they were supposed she was supposed to meet Jay for dinner, but her parents didn't tell her that this was a a marriage meeting. So when she saw Jay, she, when she found out it was actually a marriage meeting instead of just a family dinner, she ran out and, and very rudely just jumped in her car because she was just so tired of this. And she really didn't get along with her father. Her father was very uh, traditional, very, um, just very like living, he just stay in their place. He didn't agree with the fact that she was an executive at work. Her and her father didn't, didn't get along at all. And you think, that she's just an angry person. But later in the book, you understand that she was actually molested by one of the, I forget what they called it, but one of the, they called it the uncles of the church. I like think, but what we as Christians would call the pastor or the, the leader of the, uh, temple. She was actually molested by him when she was a child. So that caused her to be a very angry person. And Jay cut through all of her all of her anger and then at the end they, they fell in love. But it was very it was it was a journey because she kept pushing him away because she didn't think she was good enough to be loved. She didn't think she deserved her. She didn't think she deserved kids. And Jay really had to uh, love her and make her see he wasn't just there for her body or what she could give him but he was there to actually love her. And there is somebody here today that is really, um, that is like, doesn't think they're worthy of love, doesn't really think they're worthy of their love, the love for people or the love for the Lord. And sometimes, when we don't think we're worthy of love, we push people away. We push people away. And the Lord is saying today, stop pushing people away. Stop pushing me away. And just let me come in and love you. Let me come in and surround you with my grace, with my forgiveness, with my love. Let me come in and just be your God, and that's what the Lord wants you to know today, that you are worthy of love, that you are worthy of forgiveness, that you are worthy of His grace.
and to receive it. You know, sometimes we say that we are um, that we are worthy of that we receive his grace or whatever, but sometimes it's just words. But the Lord wants wanted to get down deep today. And for you to really receive his love. For you to really give him everything. You don't have to carry things alone. He wants you to to lighten the load and just give it all to him. He created you. He knows what you're going through right now. And he wants you to know that you are worth that you are worthy of his love. And not only his love, but you are worthy of the love of your friends. You are worthy of the love of your family. You are worthy of the love that is around you. And he wants you to receive that today. And he wants to heal the brokenness of your heart. Let his love heal your brokenness. Only his love can really heal your brokenness. And the next book I want to talk about is called uh, Malibu Rising. Malibu Rising is about essentially uh, four siblings. Um, Nina Riva. Jay Reba, Hud Rita, Hud Rita, Reba, and Kick Reba. And what happens is the book starts off with um, talking about the fires in Malibu. And you know at the end of this book there's going to be a fire. Uh, and what the book does that is so interesting is it takes you through the day of the fire. So you know the fire is coming, but it takes you through the day of the fire. And it also takes you through the background of the family, how the parents met, how the marriage broke down, and everything like that. And Mick Riva is like uh, this big celebrity, something like Mick Jagger or so, someone like Frank Sinatra. Uh, he meets June Riva. They fall in love. They have uh, they have Nina Riva and Jay Riva. Um, and then the mar marriage, after they have Jay, the marriage breaks down because he gets a wandering eye, as they say. So him and June end up getting divorced. And then he, they're apart for a few years, and then he begs to come back. He says things will be different, but they never are. So June marries him again, and then it's okay for a little while. He's home, he's a family man, and then he strays again. So June divorces him, and then by that time, they have um, one daughter. And one day in the book, while they're divorced, while no, while things are rocky, the first time around, um, this lady comes to the door with a baby, saying, "This baby is your husband's." Anyway, June is as giving as she is, takes the baby in and raises him as her own, and then and then she has. And then they get divorced, and then they get back together, and then they have a daughter. And uh, and then sadly, June is so 
broken hearted over her husband's slandering and constant lying and drives her to drink and eventually uh, June commits uh, June dies by suicide because of her depression it's so vast and then after June dies Nina takes over being the mother and then so fast forward the kids are now older but they each have scars from their father not being there and their mother dying and uh, Nina has always been the caretaker for her siblings always being the one to pick up the slack and, and be the caretaker um, especially after her mother died and uh, there is a lot of other drama that goes on um, in this book but it's kind of to the side but the main thing is uh, these uh, four siblings but at the party that night they meet Casey which is a possible fifth sibling from their dad um, and what I learned from this book is just to, to because I learned the most from Nina because she was always taking care of her brothers and sisters and never took a day for herself and then one day she realized that she could she could take a break and last night as i was thinking about this i was thinking about the title and how it said malibu rising and how uh, these four siblings they live in Malibu and all of them have issues uh, one daughter the youngest daughter she has feelings for, for women um, the one son has has a heart condition another son has a relationship with the other brother's ex-girlfriend and Nina is it and Nina as I said is the caretaker and through this novel they each come to terms with their secret and at the end it all comes out um, so one daughter comes to, to terms with the fact that she is a homosexual one the brother comes to terms with the fact that he has a heart problem um, one brother finds out that not only is he in, in love with this person but she's expecting the baby and Nina finds out that that she doesn't have to be the caretaker for her brothers and sisters so they each have their moment where they have to come to the truth of themselves and deal with the truth and what this book taught me is sometimes we can run from the truth as far as we can run from it but there is um, something deeper there and that is um, that needs to be dealt with and you can't run from the truth for long it always comes out even with Nick there's a scene with all of his children he's saying I'm finally ready to be a father but at th that time he said it too many times and it's kind of too late and he realizes that he um, just said it too many times 
and his children and don't need him anymore. Because when they needed him, when their mother died, he wasn't there. Um, and he realizes that nothing he said will make any difference. And um, each character comes to their own kind of uh, right rising moment and that's why I think the title is so interesting because it's not only rising on the waves because they're all surfers it's not only rising on the fire because they're feeling the fire but every character has their rising moment where they have to just deal with what is where what it is where what is comes up Oh, so at the end, Jay tells Hyde um, that he has a heart condition, and um, and Hyde tells Jay that um, he's expecting a baby. This is after Jay finds out about the affair with his ex-girlfriend and at the end Kit tells um, a guy that she doesn't like him that she's actually attracted to women and Nina figures out that she doesn't have to stay there anymore that her brothers and sister don't need her anymore and it is just it is just phenomenal how they all come to different different truths that they've been trying to hide. Cause sometimes I think we all need to come from these truth um, from these truths and stop running from them and face them and confront them. So my question today, the Lord's question today is, what are you not confronting and what do you need to face? Because at the end, these characters need to face their own, their own demons or their own truths. And I think when you, when you run from the truth, you can only run for so long. And that's what's going on there. Um, and that's what's going on. And keep in mind, there's a whole bunch of other things going on at this party, um, that happens. But the way the fire starts is interesting. The fire starts after the house is empty, the party's over, the very wild party is over. And Nick is sm smoking a cigarette. And then he leaves the burning cigarette just in the bushes. And it catches fire on the gravel and it, then it spreads. So, I get from that is, what I get from that is, your fire can catch any place you are. So, I believe that every human being has a fire in them, that has a passion in them, has something that is stirring in them, that will just, um, that will just affect the world and they just need um, that fire to be caught and lit. So, so where is your fire not being lit? And sometimes in the most unexpected places, uh, the fire can be lit because all through reading this book here, you're wondering when the fire's going to come, when the fire's going to start. You know the fire's coming, but you know, but you don't know when it's going to start. 
and winning thing called the drama is over, that's when the biggest thing starts. So when you think your life is over, when there's nothing else to do, that's the perfect time for God to certify and he wants to start his planet in you right now, today. So guys, I hope you've enjoyed this sermon. I definitely enjoyed uh, preaching it. I'll see you next time.